Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic guy, remember it, so you don't have to. Every once in a while, a film comes along that challenges the way we look at cinema, life, and reality itself. A film that dares to take risks, be different, and not succumb to the rules and boundaries that Hollywood has set up for them. This, my friends, is one of those movies. I am, of course, talking about the indescribable genius of Surf Ninjas. Now, many of you may look at this film and say, hey, this is the worst piece of shit I've ever paid money to see. But that's because you're not seeing the true symbolic meaning behind what looks like a gigantic load of elephant dung. For if we look at Surf Ninjas with open eyes and critical analysis, we may see something deeper than even the filmmakers could have possibly imagined. Let's take a look. First of all, I should point out that this came out one year after Three Ninjas, which came out one year after the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles films. Which is quite daring, because many people can mistake this for an even worse whip-off of the Ninja Turtle franchise. But no, this is an original construct of unbelievable power, casting nothing short but the best of Hollywood's acting talent, including famed dramatic actor Leslie Nielsen, whose film work is still considered to be at the height of cinematic excellence. And who can forget that legendary screen presence Ernie Reyes Jr., whose incredible performances as Manito in The Rundown and Cemetery Warrior No. 2 in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, still brings chills to the movie-going public. And of course, one of the gems of American cinema, who is said to be the Marlon Brando of his generation, the master himself, Rob Schneider. For indeed, how can anyone not swoon when he delivers such brilliant lines as... She's afraid to show it. She's... Probably not very attractive. And how could you not cry when he recites in all his brilliant majesty? Now don't make me come out there and beat you with a leg of mine that no longer works, cause I'll do it! And how can you, in all honesty, not orgasm at the delivery of such awesome power when he says... I've got two words to say to you. David Carradine and Kung Fu. <sighs> Our hearts are with you, perceptive angel. So at the beginning of this, epic masterpiece, we find two brothers named Johnny and Adam. They are quote-unquote surfer dudes who hang out with their best friend Iggy. They take surfing so seriously that they even treat their car as a surfboard, rowing their way to school not caring how nobody has their hand on the steering wheel, putting dozens of lives at risk. Those lovable rapscallions. They're excited because Johnny is giving a speech at high school about a visiting monk named Baba Ram. But unfortunately, a la say by the bell, he has totally forgotten about the assignment. I've got nothing. Already the film has sucked you in with its gut-wrenching suspense. How will Johnny get out of the speech if he has nothing prepared? Perhaps a uh, last-minute scribbling of notes, or a totally improvised speech, or a... Uh, uh... Ba 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 Of course! A totally on-the-spot song rendition of Barbara Ann, a song that hasn't been popular in decades, and yet somehow everyone in the school is dancing and singing to its tubular melody. <laughs> Genius. But little do they know that ninjas are looking to kill the two boys, as they dress in the same color camouflage as the Street Fighter movie. This scene right here is obviously referencing Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, because as we all know, they are both on the exact same emotional wavelength. Horror has a face. And you must make a friend of horror. What's tall, dark, wears a patch, and always seems to be on my butt? It's almost as if Four Coppola directed both movies. But luckily, there's a one-eyed Asian Charlie Chaplin to the rescue. His name is Zach, and he tells the two brothers that they are actually princes of a far-off land called... Hattusan? Portasan? Ah, uh, you mean those toilets and construction sites? Ew. This may seem like a lame joke, but it's not. It's genius. So Zach tells the brothers about the island of Patasan. It was the most peaceful place on earth. Then one day the people gathered to celebrate the birth of Crown Prince Otto and his brother, Crown Prince Yanni. Colonel Chi, a foreign mercenary, devastated our country. Notice the low angle shot here. That is to indicate that Leslie Nielsen is the bad guy. I'm often reminded of the low angle shots in Citizen Kane, the greatest movie of all time. Don't worry about me! I'm Charles Foster King! We just want to drive, but the man won't let us. Can you see the emotional similarities to these magnum opuses? I challenge you to say no! Also notice Leslie Nielsen's look of absolute evil when he approaches young Zach. Yeah! That still haunts my nightmares. 
So Nielsen gets knocked over and gets half of his face squashed by an elephant. It may seem like he's standing in that spot on purpose, or even getting under the elephant for no apparent reason, but my thought is that's much like Votan and the shattering of his spear. He knows his destiny, and instead of running away from it, he embraces his doom in a collaboration of zoom shots and what seems like lazy editing. <sighs> Genius! So thus, Nielsen has to wear a plastic mask on half of his face, no doubt symbolizing the duality of his character. In any other film, this would look positively retarded. But because it's in this film, it works. Meanwhile, we see that little Adam has the whimsical power to see images of the future. And what device does he use to harness his visions? Not fumes from the cracks of the earth like the Oracle, not an enchanted fountain like the Mirror of Galadriel, but rather a Sega Game Gear that shows Adam exactly what's going to happen in a matter of seconds. It's like the legends of Greek mythology live again! Also notice the use of Playboy magazines here, even though this is so obviously a children's film. Always pushing the envelope this movie, challenging us with the threat of sexual arousal. So Zach takes Johnny, Adam, and of course, adorable Iggy, to the center headquarters of all the Padusan people, a Chinese restaurant. The best Padusani food in LA. There, Johnny's introduced to his future wife, who is arranged to marry him. Proof that people don't need to have relationships or similar interests, as long as they are both attractive, true love will shine through. But the ninjas arrive, and so Johnny must discover his true ability as a ninja warrior, not through years of physical training, not through the hardships of mental wisdom, but through magic. Notice the use of Beethoven's Ode to Joy, no doubt exactly the subject matter he had in mind when he wrote this epic piece. Note also that the ninjas, rather than get up and fight some more, roll out of the way as if to say, I had my chance, and now I must let others take my place. These guys are going where no other film dares! 